Rebecca has these seven words that she submitted to me today. All about possibilities with detours and digressions. Please welcome her. I love the fact that we have the same pile of books here. <laughs> I added one more. So, um, your seven words. I, I don't always start by going back to them, but I, I love them. And I love them in, in particular because digression for me is, uh, is truly a mode of living. Um, it's a mode of delaying the end also. It's a mode of sauntering. And I think in many ways um, it may be something of that nature for you. Um, so before asking you to comment on that, I want to read to you what for me is one of the most beautiful definitions of digression. Lawrence Stern, in The Life of Tristram Shandy, says digressions incontestably are the sunshine, they are the life, the soul of reading. Take them out of the book, for instance. You might as well take the book along with them. One cold, eternal winter could reign in every page of it. Restore them to the writer, he steps forth like a bridge groom, bids all hail, brings in variety, and forbids the appetite to fail. And I'm wondering... Oh, that's lovely. Isn't it? Yes. Back to the 18th century, always. At, uh, but digression, you know, the kind of the question driving my book, A Field Guide to Getting Lost, is from a platonic dialogue. How will you go about finding that thing, the nature of which is totally unknown to you, which feels like life's basic question about love, about purpose, about meaning, about connection, etc. And there's all these things you can't find straightforwardly. You can't sort of barge out with your credit card and get them at Macy's to talk about the neighborhood or something. That And digression is an art of kind of letting things lead to things, letting what you know lead to what you surmise to maybe what you don't know. And that kind of meandering is a form of discovery in itself, I think, and as well as a form of pleasure. I'm possibilities in my seven words is really kind of an agenda, but digressions and detours is the pleasure that goes with them, which makes me think uh, I wish I could cite it verbatim. Orwell's great Why I Write, where he talks about all these very clear agendas, political agendas he has, but also about if I did not love the surface of the earth and useless bits of, scraps of useless information. You know, and he talks about all these pleasures too. So possibilities is agenda, I think, but detours and digressions is how you, how you get there without it being some kind of tank But also march. How, we, how we stay in the summer um, yeah. When, when Stern says that without digression we would be living in winter. Well, he talked about rainy winter, and as a yeah. Californian, the rainy part is really exciting to us. Well, well New York, you can send us some u <laughs> unused rain if you like. You know, of course, winter. Yeah, it's interesting. Native Californians actually have all, and Native Nevadans have have stories they only tell in winter and these seasonal stories. I remember a white kid when I was hanging out with the Western Shoshone being, I really want to hear that story and somebody saying, great, come back in December to somebody in June or something like that. And uh, so, you know, winter has its uses. Speaking as a climate activist. We'll get to that in, in some <laughs> moments. We'll digress sure. climate we'll, di words. we'll digress, yeah, we'll digress and um, I, I think I'm, I'm always interested also in, in digression as it pertains to not getting to, the, to a point. Where the, po where the point is not the point. Right. <laughs> because, and it's interesting, I did an essay for Harper's recently called Preach in Praise of Preaching to the Choir, 
And there is an argument often propounded by straight men who do not spend enough time in libraries that all conversation should be purposeful, agenda-driven. Um, what what's that word we all use all the time now? At uh, sort of exchange-driven, transactional. And it kind of doesn't recognize how many things must need to be done in conversation that don't necess that are not proselytizing, bullying, conversion therapy, you know, didactic um, aggression, or et cetera, but are mutual kind of play and exploration, affirmation, encouragement, and um, I remember when you things. spoke to me about preaching to the choir. In, in, yeah. in, to the choir, not choir. Yeah. I can't speak this language after so many years. <laughs> which, which, how many languages did you speak before this? It depends how much I drink, really. <laughs> um, but, but, but more or less fluently for. But there's no virtue to it. It just is that my parents exposed my sister and me to languages. And so we learned them, English, French, German, and Spanish, by virtue of being um, simply in contact, brought in contact with them. But it created in me, I think, a slight accent. Um, <laughs> we um, weren't I'm going told, to tell you, I'm Paul. I'm told, I'm told. <laughs> but um, I was going preaching to the choir. I mean, it's, it's choir. Um, uh, sorry. Speaching, uh, pre uh, preaching to the choir. Um, the idea there is that we speak to like-minded people, or we speak to people whose adjectives in part we share. Yeah, yeah, no, the term preaching to the choir used disdainfully by many members of the left suggests that we have no reason to talk to people who agree with us in general outlines, which makes, I think, a number of mistakes. First of all, about the pleasure of conversation. Second of all, about our success at converting people who don't agree with us. You know, getting a climate denier to agree with you about climate is usually a particularly hideous way to waste your life. <laughs> and, and of course, and then from a purely political sense, you don't need everybody who's a climate denier to agree with you about climate, you know, and then force them to do so through some sort of verbal slate of hand. You need all the people who already believe that climate change is real and terrible and urgent to get up and do something about it. You don't need, you know, the, you don't need to convert the, you know, I don't want to say unbelievers or infidels or one of those horrible crusading words. You don't need to, but you don't need to convert. You need to el energize. And I and um, but you also say that you only also, need a few people. Well, sometimes, and it depends on, you know, but I also think that a lot of, there's, and my ed editor Emily at Harper's, when I wrote that, pointed out how deeply intellectual the disdain in preaching to the choir is. It suggests if you and I agree that books are good, then we have nothing further to say about books to each other. We can all go home now. And, um, you know, that there isn't, a value in deeper exploration. If you and I agree that climate change is real and urgent and pressing, we have everything to talk about. How will they imagine this point in history in the year, you know, 2318? What's the best way to think to do about it? What should we understand about the way that people behave in disasters to think about climate refugees? Can we imagine the utopia of a world without fossil fuel that means without the powers of Saudi Arabia and the Koch brothers and uh, et, et cetera? And you know, there's so much more to say. And I often find that people who agree with me in essentials have a lot to teach me about the details. They may correct or transform what I think or fill in details I don't know. And if you're a climate scientist and I'm a political organizer, we have different pieces of the urgent question of climate change. But and then there's also the other things we do with conversation. And I am a former young woman, and so much of what young women did together was these long conversations back on phones when phones were things you talked into that you could hear before they became things people barked into briefly and did everything else on. And um, 
but these long conversations that were really like, you deserve good things, it's not okay what he's doing, your mother is actually crazy, <laughs> and um, it's, you know, but a lot of just affirming that we had the right to feel what we felt and want what we wanted, and that was, you know, when lots of other things were trying to chisel us out of us. So conversation does so many things, and there's a reason why all these people who probably agree with me about most things came to hear us have a conversation. And we and don't know what will happen. And that, well, that's the other thing, is because preaching to the choir assumes that it's very, not only kind of transactional, but programmatic. I am here to badger you into signing up for my, you know, my plan or something. And it's such a dismal view of human interaction. Aside from the fact that I talked to an actual preacher, because I was trained as a journalist, I researched even when I read essays, and who pointed, and uh, no, as actually a choral singer pointed out, the chorus is behind the preacher who preaches to the congregation, <laughs> which then of course reminded me that the choir, the preacher may preach to the choir, the choir sings to the preacher and the congregation, and then the congregation gossips on the church steps and everybody, you know, gets to have their say in that scheme of things. But you know, also it, it, it strikes me I, that, um, when a friend of mine once said, you know, we, we should argue with people with whom we agree, and to some extent yeah. there's great truth, because when you were saying about books, we all agree that reading books is a good thing, and we love books, but what books? Yeah, what books, and why, what and wh books? who, and, who and are you when you're reading a book? Where are you when you're reading a book? Who are you? Yeah, and those kinds of questions. And so who are you when you're reading a book? And I'm really interested, I've been thinking about it for the, thing, the book I'm writing now, that funny state where you're in your imagination, you're, in your, you're kind of not in, quite in your body, you're not in the room, you're imaginatively entering the world that the writer has created in some ways, but my version of what rooms look like in Chekhov is probably not Chekhov's version, or you know, my, you know wha how you hear things, how you imagine things. It's part of why often people who really love books cringe when they're converted to films. And um, they didn't look like that, they didn't sound like that, it didn't happen that way. But there's that funny between worlds, that liminal state of you're in something that's in between what the writer wrote and what you read. This kind of meeting of the minds that creates a place that's not your imagination because it's and not their imagination so it's liminal between two imaginations and liminal between where you are physically and where you are imaginatively some way, somewhere in one of your books you talk about the fact that a young woman writing hears from someone that she will be loved by people she will never oh meet. it was do you remember where it is i do it's a book called lark rise to candleford by flora thompson who grew up among the peasantry in Cambridgeshire, 1870s or 80s, England, and a Roma woman told her fortune, you will be loved by people you've never met, which is a beautiful definition of a writer whose work reaches people. And it's funny, because it reminds me, actually, speaking of digression, when we were in New Orleans for the New Orleans Atlas, which preceded the New York Atlas, came after the San Francisco Atlas, New Orleanians are not in a hurry, which is one of the wonderful things about them. You know, they don't talk on cell phones a lot, and they have a lot of parades in the street. And um, although I do remember a young man on my first visit to New Orleans who was making out with someone in a doorway who turned around and said, don't wait till you get home. So they may be impatient, but they're not in a hurry. <laughs> and um, But somebody in the midst of a line, a, signing, a long line to sign copies of the Atlas decided to give me a palm reading, and it was New Orleans, so the fact that this was not the most efficient use of time, and it meant everybody behind her would wait for a while, would wait. And she said this completely lovely thing to me, which is, despite everything, you are who you were meant to be. So, first time I've said that out loud. It's the first time I've heard that thought. It was so really kind of amazing because it's, you know, it can be thought of in a lot of different ways. And um, so, but it was really, and there's, you know, I'm, some of you know I write about violence against women a lot and I've had my own adventures in that. And it was interesting, the sense of, 
often we have of being diminished by trauma or somehow, and I think, I think Americans are miserable utopians since things should be perfect, we're miserable that they're not, as opposed to a lot of Europeans who I think are cheerful cynics. Since things should be a bit of a mess, it's fine that they are. You know, one, and of, uh, one, of my, one of the essays I love the most of yours is your essay on Wolf's Darkness. Yes. Um, I, I reread it yesterday and I really, I really love it, and in a way, it fits beautifully in what we're talking about now, because where are you when you are exploring? Who yeah. are you when you're writing? Who are you when you're reading? Yeah, when you're reading. What is that thing, the nature of which is totally unknown to you? And it's interesting, because I do have these very particular agendas, death to patriarchy and fossil fuel corporations, for starters, to be very straightforward. <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're the choir, you should sing. <laughs> but we'll settle for clapping. But I'm also really interested, again, and you know, digression and meandering, and, and um, I, th you know, the, I wrote a field guide to getting lost and hope in the dark around the same time, and there's this period where I thought, like, you know, like, am I two different people? Here's this book about public life that's very encouraging, and here's this very melancholic book that's not only about getting lost, but about loss. And then I realize about, both of them were about coming to terms with uncertainty and the unknown and unknowable, about a kind of numinousness in the world that I find really encouraging, a word that literally means to instill courage, because um, that sense of possibility that Pe optimism and pessimism are f forms of certainty that think they know what will happen, which means we need do nothing. But hope for me is a kind of sense of possibility that maybe if we try, we'll get there. Maybe if we intervene, it will come out without everybody being massacred. I just didn't want to butcher that first line, okay. which is just so beautiful, Wolf's Darkness, um, where you, you quote her at the beginning, it's called Wolf's Darkness. It was written or published in 2009. It has as, uh, as a subtitle, Embracing the Inexplicable. And I find the beginning totally haunting. It says, the future is dark, which is the best thing the future can be, I think. Virginia Woolf wrote in her journal on January 18, 1915, when she was almost 33 years old and the First World War was beginning to turn into a catastrophic slaughter on an unprecedented scale that would continue for years. I mean, I'd, I'd love to read the whole essay, but <laughs> that would take the time of our conversation. But Yeah, that essay was kind of the cornerstone of, it's where the title Hope in the Dark comes from. And it's, you know, it's an epigraph to Hope in the Dark that I went back to to look, spend less time looking at the political world described in that book and more time looking at Wolf. But it was such a compelling sentence for somebody who had recently again had mental health issues, who was in the midst of war, et cetera, to say. And Wolf was more than almost anyone I can think of an enthusiast at ease with mystery, unknowability, numinousness, darkness. And darkness, I think, the future, the future is dark, I think, meant that we don't know what's coming. And the future is dark, which is the best thing I think it can be, it, it can be I think. And I love that, I think. And well, there's I a funny that. way we're writing as a woman, I put all these qualifiers in, and then I often delete them so that it becomes a more manly, bald statement. And rather than I, you know, I think, Trump is evil. You know, you can cross that out and just say Trump is evil. <laughs> but that, that Virginia Woolf uses a lot of those qualifiers to create that kind of ruminative, exploratory, introspective, subjective description. And it's one of the things that makes her one of my two or three favorite writers is that she can write these profoundly polemical things like A Room with a View and Professions for Women and Three Guineas. But she can also represent better than anybody deep interior life and it's kind of mysterious unfoldings and uh, you know this kind of removal from the practical world and that, that span is amazing. That walk she takes, I can't remember the essay, she, the walk she takes to find a pencil at night. 
Oh, it's called Street Haunting, a London Adventure, and I teach it a lot, where she pretends, uses the excuse of going to go buy a pencil. And I'm sure it's a concocted or compounded essay that she did not go out on a walk exactly like that. But she describes all these things she sees, and she sees people and imagines their lives, and dresses and imagines wearing them, and just in the course of going, you know, buys a pencil from a couple who quarrel and thinks about them, and just, you know, and I think she purposely picture, picked the most plebeian thing, a London errand for a pencil in, you know, at to in winter, the winter that... Uh, Between four and six. Uh, Lawrence Stern. Yeah. What, yeah, that Lawrence Stern doesn't particularly want to go to. And I think it's pretty dark in winter, uh, between four and six in London. But um, to take that absolute plebeianism and show the endless amount of voyaging that can happen in your imagination as you enter into all these other lives. And she has a beautiful passage too. I've quoted various places. I know it's in Field Guide about, I, I, it's actually it's from Street Haunting, about shedding that kind of containment of your possibilities that other people project onto you. And, and I know that well, that sense of people around you who know you, think they know you, are constantly telling you who you are. You're a person who doesn't like this and likes that and doesn't do this and does that. And they really, you all, even in a loving way, can insist on your limits. And there's a limitlessness to being anonymous and wandering that she celebrates. And there's such an interesting tension to get yeah. to the book now between not defining and defining, calling things by their true name, yeah. and also wanting a kind of a fluid, porous sense of self. But I don't think those things are opposite. I'm not saying they're opposite, yeah. but they, there's a kind of, you know, the, there's I another wonderful line of is Stern yeah. where he says, to define is to distrust. It's interesting though, because call them by their true names. Euphemisms and circumlocutions and lies are a kind of prison, and there's a way you break out of it by to make things fluid and true again, in a way. And one of the things we don't talk about much is that the really important thing that happens in fairy tales isn't enchantment, it's disenchantment, where you turn back into yourself, where the beast stops being a beast, where, uh, you know, okay, there's, I'm now thinking of anomalies like a little mermaid, but, um, you know, the end of the 12 swans where the brothers turn back into brothers as their sister, you know, throws the, um, garment she's knitted out of nettles while remaining silent all those years while being up she's about to be burned as a witch um, and she hasn't been able to speak up in her defense because to save her brothers who've been turned into a swans by a wicked stepmother and fairy tales have very particular rules she has to knit these shirts for them out of nettles and they come as she's being carried to where she'll be burned to death and she throws them on these swans who turn into brothers and defend her but the twelfth brother the youngest one she hasn't finished the knitting so he goes through life with one arm that's a, a swan's wing and um, which i saw somebody draw somewhere but trying to oh it's in a wonderful edition of hans christian anderson did Pe did Penguin publish it that came out recently on the cover? But we were talking about calling things by their true names, I believe. We are, we Brothers are. Brothers by and, their and true in a forms. Way, and in a way, no, 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 it, 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 I'm, I'm following you. Um, and, and, um, and, and that... How's that going? Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll let other judge, but I, 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 I truly enjoy the, the, the losing. Um, I truly, I truly, you know, that wonderful line that you, you quote somewhere of, of Benjamin that to find one's way in a city is easy, to lose oneself is an yeah. art. And I, I love this, and I love, I love this moment, by the way. Um, um, I, of course, um, we, we're going to spend some time on call them by their true names, but we're also going to go in many other directions as we have already. And I will be quoting various things to you and okay. hopefully getting reactions from you. Um, and I'd uh, like you to, ha to have you react to, to those creators and philosophers and artists and thinkers and people who have called things by their true name. One of them is a wonderful quotation you have of Mary Beard when she says, we have never escaped a certain male cultural 
desire for women's silence. I, it struck me as so powerful. I could silently quote Beyonce. <laughs> but, um, yeah, well, Christine Blasey Ford. You know, you could, not, you could not even have any verbs and make a case with that, or Moira Donegan. And um, if you follow that, Stephen Elliott trying to, uh, suing Moira Donegan for $1.5 million for creating the Shitty Men in Media spreadsheet on which some anonymous person accused him of things. And it was really, the spreadsheet was about the fact that women ha have not, and this was about actually shitty men in media, so it was about the fact that women have not successfully had recourse from university administrations, as my friend Emma Sokowitz has demonstrated, from law enforcement or from human resources offices. And really this ha list happened shortly after me too with can we just quietly tell each other? And it is really useful to know like, oh, this editor is a predator, oh, this guy will, you know, et cetera. And the fact that she's being sued for just creating the list on which other people said their things is really interesting, this sort of desire to punish her for speaking. And then, you know, Christine Blasey Ford can't go home be to that house with two doors because of her trauma, because of death threats against her. And it was interesting, this time around I had a, you know, I was joking to my friends last night that I've spent a lot more time, I spend more time reading about rape than most people I know, except for other feminists and stuff. And I realize I've never heard of a man who had to go into hiding because of being accused of rape. I'm sure it, I'm sure it happens, but I've heard so many stories about women who, you know, women who've been doxxed, feminists like Jessica Valenti here in New York City who are doxxed, which means they expose all your personal information, like where you live and send you threats. Uh, Anita Sarkeesian of uh, Feminist Frequency. You know, women have uh, re routinely received death threats for speaking, and um, that does bespeak a certain desire for female silence. And it's, you know, and of course, you know, I wrote a long essay in The Mother of All Questions uh, about silence and about male silence, female silence, and their kind of reciprocities, breaking the silence, nearly driven by that wonderful silence equals death epithet from the AIDS, queer activists in the AIDS era. But yeah, you, Mary I, Beard is right, and she's received quite a lot of harassment herself. And uh, harassment threats, really obscene, things, and of course, pompous fools mansplaining the classics to her. Those, pr probably everyone here knows Mary Be Beard is a classic scholar who's also a very eloquent feminist, but she did have, I think it was Piers Morgan or somebody tweeting at her about um, Roman history, and um, for some reason that made sense to him at the time, like, namely the assumption he knew what the fuck he was talking about. <laughs> And you've Maybe it wasn't Piers Morgan. Somebody fact check that. That's easy enough. What's, what's, what's harder, um, well, no, let's take it differently. I mean, you sent me yesterday or the day before five articles about Kavanaugh. Related to Kavanaugh, about the larger construct of the men who didn't want, who don't want to know, about, you know, and all these bizarre kind of antics of patriarchy around this case. And one of the things antics most... Antics of patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things that has become much more obvious, I think, in the Trump era, one of the things we've been told is that women are not fit, fit to speak because we're irrational, we're emotional, we're mendacious, we're vindictive, etc. And then you look at the crazy stuff these guys say. I, you know that um, before Christine Blasey Ford's identity was known, this guy, Ed Whelan, who's part of the kind of right-wing think tank attack machine, sent out a series of tweets where he was like, was, maybe she was, and he went from proposing maybe she was drunk, in which case her memory couldn't be trusted, to you could see him convincing himself this person, nobody knows who she, or he doesn't know who she is. He, all he knows is that she says Kavanaugh assaulted her at a party. And he goes from thinking, speculating that she was drunk to essentially believing himself because he's a man, so he has authority. So he ends up believing she's drunk 
and shouldn't be believed. And you see the absolute irrationality of this vindictive guy. And it's something I wrote about earlier in an essay called Cassandra Among the Creeps. It was a cover story at Harper's, um, back when Harper's was publishing my feminism. And, um, and um, we could digress there, but we won't. It seems an unnecessary. Another time. And um, they published, I was the first woman to sit in the easy chair, which freaked me out because it's like, they should have hired Hannah Arendt 50 years ago. They should have hired Willa Cather 100 years ago to be the first woman to write this 150 year old column was like if the first black baseball player happened, you know, this decade instead of Jackie Robinson's era. But, um, you know, there was this, assertion that women are unqualified to speak, but those assertions themselves are often histrionic, irrational, highly emotional, like a lot of, like the way that men were so emotional about Hillary Clinton in ways that made them unable to function sensibly, so many of them. And, um, but you really, yeah, you know, there is this whole, um, Patriarchal antics is this position that men are rational, women are irrational, and then you see this absolute irrationality of like t deciding that a woman you know nothing about must have been drunk because it would be so convenient if she was, or the bizarre stuff of witnessing Blasey Ford's incredibly compelling behavior as a witness you know, to her own experience where she's cogent, she's consistent, et cetera. And then Kavanaugh says all these things that are demonstrably false. And he has a history of lies. He's lied about what he did during the Bush administration. He's lied about receiving stolen information from, et cetera, when he was a Bush operative, et cetera. We know he's a liar. And then they decide that we cannot doubt Kavanaugh. That is so irrational. That is patriarchal antics. S someone else who could be in an easy chair. If we could look at video number one, please. Oh, there's a video. Who knew? It's right there. Oh, okay. Ms. Carson maintains that the balance of nature is a major force in the survival of man, whereas the modern chemist, the modern biologist, the modern scientist believes that man is steadily controlling nature. Now, uh, to these people, apparently, the, the balance of nature was something that was uh, repealed as soon as man came on the scene. Well, you might just as well assume that you could repeal the, the law of gravity. The balance of nature is built of a series of interrelationships between living things and between living things and their environment. You can't just step in with some brute force and change one thing without changing a good many others. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that we must never interfere, that we must not attempt to tilt that balance of nature in our favor. But unless we do bring these chemicals under better control, we are certainly headed for disaster. Yeah, Rachel Carson's gender was used against her, and I did an inter there is somebody in the room who knows far more about Rachel Carson than me, but I did spend some time reading all the contemporary reviews of Silent Spring, her book that really launched a kind of, you could almost call it an intersectional environmental movement, one where we under, basically the conservation movement was about protecting pretty places out there, the environmental movement is about a much more systematic systemic understanding, and Carson, more than anyone, brings us to that transition. And she was attacked so much for her gender and called irrational, hysterical, etc., for saying that DDT was extremely dangerous, and she was factually accurate. And, you know, she was criticized for, like, not listening to the scientists. And, of course, there are a bunch of scientists being paid by the pesticide companies to say that there was, this stuff was harmless but Rachel Carson actually was a scientist. And so to hear a scientist being told that she doesn't understand science and should listen to scientists is patriarchal antics. It sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was, it was really interesting looking at, 
that kind of ad hominem attack that's so often used against women where we won't even think about what you'll say, we'll just assume you're not qualified to speak, which is part of what Mary Beard is talking about, all the different ways the ancient Greeks considered women for not having deep voices, for not being rational beings, for being sort of inferior in various ways, for needing to be controlled by wearing veils or kept within the walls of home, etc., cetera, um, were unqualified to participate in public life and public speaking. You, you have this line uh, about climate change, and we'll get to quite a few others where you say, future generations are going to curse most of us for d distracting ourselves with trivialities as a planet burned. Yeah, that would be calling things by their true names. We are in the midst of a crisis that's unlike any other crisis. And it's easy, it's funny, it's so easy for me to write about feminism because it's so personal, you know, and I feel like I'm fighting a battle for my grandmothers and myself and people like me, whether they're, you know, women in Africa or, you know, Rohingya women or whatever, but, you know, or girls or, you know, people. And, um, and climate change is not easy, easy even for me to set aside for a while. And, um, and harder to convey. I've been, it's been interesting looking at how people like Bill McKibben keep trying to find different frameworks to tell us the story in a way that makes it compelling and urgent and gripping again. But the fact, you know, the IPCC report that came out a couple of Mondays ago, two Mondays ago, I think, was that we have 12 years in which to tra radically transform uh, the way we produce and consume energy and then to force to go for not to prevent climate change which is here and which will continue to develop but to choose the best case scenario and not the worst case scenario and of course the Trump administration is an enormous obstacle but as under the Bush administration California and a lot of other states and regions cities a lot of you know are making independent endeavors to keep with the Paris Accords, which of course only limit us to three degrees of warming. We need to, as the most climate vulnerable nations chanted at Paris when I was there two, three years ago now, 1.5 to stay alive, 1.5 degrees Celsius is the max, and we're at one degree Celsius already, 1.5 is the maximum before a lot of, you know, island nations go underwater, places um, become uninhabitable, um, the kind of climate chaos we've seen of fires, hurricanes, f uh, torrential rains, etc., become worse. And you see, it's, th th this for me is the core. Um, when you were saying Bill McKibben is trying to find ways yeah. to make a story compelling, to tell a story that will, I, I'm not sure you would agree, I mean, not frighten us, no. but no, probably not frighten, but I th in a way to encourage us in that literal sense to instill courage and that's something because there are there's a kind of climate writing that's often not particularly well informed there's a piece in New York magazine recently that the scientists kind of ripped apart that was very apocalyptic and you know possibilities is you know is we still have a lot of room to choose the best case rather than the worst case scenario you don't want to just you know you want people to know both how much power we have over what happens and how terrible what's happening is and how much worse it will be if we do nothing, if we let the fossil fuel corporations uh, continue, you know, and fossil fuel states like Russia and Saudi Arabia and to some extent the US dictate uh, global energy policy. So one thing your work and your most recent book has made me think about a lot um, is euphemism, a lot, 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 lot. And um, it made me also think back that um, calling things by their true names, by their true name, there is this um, wonderful um, passage, which I think is sort of central to, to the book, where you say, climate change is global scale violence against places and living species as well as against human beings. Mm 
once we call it by its true name, we can start having a real conversation about our priorities and values, because the revolt against brutality begins with a revolt against the language that hides that brutality. And in very early on in the book, you speak about calling things by their right name at least, at least gives us an opportunity, perhaps, of a diagnosis. Yeah, I, I hang out with doctors a lot, and you know, a diagnosis is not a cure, but until you know what's wrong, you can't do anything. And even if it's uncurable, you can still make a lot of decisions about care and, you know, um, amelioration, things like that. But also, you know, so much of what happens, I'm, you know, when the Bush administration convinced the New York Times and other entities to refer to torture as enhanced interrogation, they legitimized torture. And there was a back and forth about that and during the Bush era. And really, you know, call torture torture, and then you can't, and then the fact that we're debating whether it's okay or not becomes ridiculous because torture is illegal under the Geneva Convention and various other human rights laws, our own laws. And, uh, you know, so you see this euphemistic process. They had like some euphemism like tender age camps for the baby gulags they're putting refugee children in when they're separating them from their parents. And you, you can see the euphemisms around that. Was a, and also the opposite of euphemisms, where you portray, you know, refugees as invaders, for example, when you demonize people through the use of language. Could we, could we look at image number eight? I had no idea we ate this was an AV thing. So I don't know if you can read this. Probably, can you read it? I can. That's, that's today's yes. news front wow. page. How would you rewrite that? Oh my God. I'd, it's weird to, it's funny they put voluntary in quotes. It's been interesting seeing the newspapers deal, how do you address a president who's a pathological liar, seeing them become more and more blunt, seeing how often the Washington Post's most important stories are a hybrid between editorial and reporting. Voluntary, the quotes seem to do it. Can people read it? Trump's plans to deter migrants could mean new, quote, voluntary, unquote, family separations. And um, the Trump administration is weighing an array of new policies that it hopes will deter Central Americans from journeying north. One plan would ask migrants to choose between voluntarily relinquishing their children to foster care or remaining imprisoned together as a family. And it seems pretty accurate in that the voluntarily relinquishing their children, you know, it's just, it's accurate, the voluntary, you know, and it's weird, because one of the things that took me a little while to understand with this administration is they don't actually care what we think and they don't care that we know how much of it is lies and distortions, that they, they're essentially a target marketed product and as long as their target audience is buying their product, they think that's good enough. You know, as long as they're managing to disenfranchise tens of mil uh, you know, millions of Americans and target market. And it's interesting with this election coming up because, you know, another one of their things that's not a euphemism exactly, but um, they've used voter fraud as a kind of fictitious, which is, a, essentially a fictitious problem. It's not known to have changed the outcome of any election in recent times, and it's a, a problem so infinitesimal it doesn't constitute an actual problem to the f um, free and fair elections, but they've used it to create massive disenfranchisement campaigns with cross-check, with voter ID laws, et cetera, and they were looking at uh, possibly 30% of the electorate in Georgia being disenfranchised, et cetera, and it's interesting because that's been not been talked about, or it's been talked about in a very piecemeal way, which is one of the problems of the news is that they'll look at what's happening in Georgia with voter disenfranchisement and not connect it to what's happening to native people in North Dakota or to, um, you know, with voter ID in Texas or, you know, there's all these states. 
I don't know what New California is actually pretty good on this, that, but all these other states, what is it? Oh, Kansas, where they moved the only polling station a mile outside of town. I read that Lyft and Uber, horrible in other ways, and responsible for a lot of taxi driver su uh, suicides in this town, are making a big fuss about themselves that they'll now drive people to the poll that's a mile outside of town in this um, Dodge City, Kansas. But if you put it all together, you see a massive campaign to prevent democracy that is really pretty shocking and one of the most undercovered stories. And it's also calling things by their true names is also a kind of a process of aggregation sometimes, of adding up how this, ins and it's one of the things feminism has done a lot is to say that we, that you know, this campus rape is not, you know, a mysterious thing that suddenly happened that we don't understand. It's part of an epidemic we understand really well. And this amazing storytelling that's gone on uh, with all the hashtags with Christine Blasey Ford, why I didn't report, for example, builds this kind of dossier of evidence of how things happen on this body of stories that tend towards the same direction. And this, speaking of choruses, this kind of choral role of women on social media in the kind of mass education project of feminism the last several years has been really amazing. That was a digression. No, 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 it did Or at least a meander. Uh, 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 it went places. From, it, from it, other it, places. It did, and you know, when, I, when, when you mentioned diagnosis, I, I often think about if, you, if you're sick and you, you go and see a doctor and the doctor tells you you're fine, there, there really is no hope. So well, we if he denies that there's a problem, right. and it's interesting, one of the revolutions in our time to be literal, of, well, you have more of a question to it, so. Uh, well, no, I have, well, I, yes, I do, but um, th I want to read this quotation to you. I want okay. to read this quotation from you, for you, uh, <laughs> because in a way I think it serves beautifully as a, a backdrop in some ways to your book. It's, a, it's from Politics in the English Language. Orwell, George Orwell writes the following, in our time, political speech and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible. Things like the continuance of British rule in India, the Russian purges and deportations, the dropping of the atom bombs, uh, atom bombs on Japan can indeed be defended, but only by arguments which are too brutal for people to face and which do not square with the professed aims of political parties. Thus, political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question begging and sheer cloudy vagueness. Defenseless villages are bombarded from the air, the inhabitants driven out into the countryside, the cattle machine gunned, the hut set on fire with incendiary bullets. This is called pacification. Millions of peasants are robbed of their farms and set trudging along the roads with no more than they can carry. This is called transfer of population or rectification of frontiers. People are imprisoned for years without trial or shot in the back of the neck was sent to die of scurvy in Arctic lumber camps. This is called elimination of unreliable elements. Such phraseology is needed if one wants to name things without calling up mental pictures of them. So. I've been reading a lot of Orwell lately. Yeah. And um, how does this? Speak? Yeah. No, I've. You know. It's what was the slogan I saw recently? Make George or make ne George Orwell fiction again? Yeah, or something. And of course, he was as much an essayist as a novelist, and I think a better essayist than novel a novelist in many ways. But uh, yeah, and you can see the brutalities. But it, we have a diff we have a somewhat different process that's almost more blatant now. And you could see with the Saudi murder of Khashoggi, they went from. He left the embassy alive. We didn't do anything to him to, you know, kinds of weird obfuscation to now this ridiculous idea, agreement that he died in a fist fight as though this 60-year-old journalist was, you know, 
happened to encounter somebody with a bone saw in a corridor and got pugilistic, and it's so ridiculous. But of course, it follows exactly the same, like the Stormy Daniels thing, where there was no payoff. Trump didn't know about the payoff. Oh, you know, the payoff wasn't because they had sex together. You know, and this kind of slippage, slippage where the truth eventually comes out, but they somehow think they're doing something, and they probably are for people who want plausible deniability. But yeah, but there's the euphemisms, the collateral damage for civilian deaths and things like that. But there's also all this other obfuscation. And then we have the bald untruths. And you know, and the US media participate in pretending that there were two sides to cl climate change and the merchants of doubt, um, as Natalie Oreskes called them, who were paid by the fossil fuel companies to you know, the scientists who like the people paid by the DDT companies to argue with Rachel Carson pretended that there was two sides when there was a massive co scientific consensus. And um, Is euphemism another way of speaking about propaganda? And it's interesting because it happens, I think propaganda has to be specific to politics and et cetera, like, you know, like your grandmother probably used euphemisms about bodily functions, which didn't make I her the minister so. of propaganda in the household necessarily, just like a very late Victorian, but... Um, so euphemism can be a, a form of being um, educated. Squeamish, a yeah, yeah. We went from so. educated to squeamish. Well, I don't think yeah. euphemisms no. involve education. No. Although there's those old books you probably have many of in this library where when things got sort of dirty, they'd translate them into Latin and really dirty, they'd go into Greek. And then <laughs> there was some other language and you had to be like more and more educated to read the naughtier and naughtier bits of like the satiricon or something like that. And I think they would revert to like old Aramic or something for the really exciting things. I've always been interested by, you know, the etymology of the word erudite, which yeah. literally means taking out off the roughness, hmm. the rude, r so, yeah. you know, when you're well polished. Yeah. And so euf euphemism in some form can be a way of remaining polished and polite, but in the context in which we're speaking about it, yeah. it's different. Yeah, yeah, well, it depends on what the agenda is, if the agenda is to perpetrate atrocities. Um, which was not your grandmother's intent, <laughs> well, I presume. So would the contrary of, yeah, <laughs> would the contrary of euphemism then be spelling things out? I, th I think it's being direct or straightforward, calling things by their true names, a euphemisms I think of as being about a, a kind of squeamish avoidance, you know, he passed away rather than that he died. Whereas there's another kind of political lie that Orwell was very focused on because it, under Stalinism and the war effort and that a very interesting point once before when the left was so in love with Russia, it didn't want to look at Stalinism. Rather as parts of the left have cut Putin some very big excuses in the present, um, the need to cut through the evasiveness, the polite terms for monstrous things, and describe what was going on. What would the world look like without euphemism? The world? What would the world look like? And I think, I don't know. <laughs> I, it's a, that's a non-euphemistic answer. And um, and I think that there's always there are sometimes reasons to say things indirectly, and that there's actually a wonderful use of metaphor and allusion and circumlocution, et cetera, for getting at things. You know, I don't want to reduce the world to new speak, you know, or some kind of super simplistic directness. And it gets back to preaching to the choir. I don't think that language needs to be merely transactional. I think that metaphor and allusion and uh, you know meandering towards something can be poetic and actually help you understand it more deeply than if it's sort of baldly thrust in your face. But that's very, again, it's about intentions. You know, a poet uses a metaphor to give you a sense of relationships between the thing itself and the metaphor, you know, or a, an idea and an object or 
between two things. Uh, you know, the, st the state uses a, a term like tender age camps to avoid saying we're torturing small children in ways that will be irreparable. You know, you write in, in one of your essays about Jarvis Masters, yeah. and, um, who's a death row inmate, and recently there was a, a large prison strike across the country, and among the demands of the prisoners were for calling an immediate end to prison slavery. Um, that seems to be a way of getting at things. Yeah, and there's been and a really interesting a revendication that's important. And there's a renaming process, like when Michelle, not that was it, Michelle Alexander, who wrote the new Jim Crow. Yeah, you know, to call the prison industrial complex a term probably coined by Ruthie Gilmore, perhaps. You know, to call it the new Jim Crow makes a connection. So in a way, it's a metaphor or an analogy that allows us to understand something. So it's a, it's a kind of indirect language that lets us see something in a really important way. And this fits beautifully with what I was going to ask you. I love your atlases. Um, you spoke about one of yeah. them uh, in this very library about a year ago. Two and years. Two years? Yeah, just before the election, but oh dear. after... Okay, so time flies, yeah. but um, you spoke about it two years ago in San Francisco, New Orleans, New York. Let's imagine, this is a, a project I'd love to see happen. Let's imagine that your new project is a, a dictionary. Yes. Um, a dictionary of what needs to be renamed. Um, a dictionary where in some form or fashion you reclaim language. What might that dictionary look like, and what are some of the words off the top of your head that would need, I mean, that are in desperate need, nearly craving, nearly yearning, nearly calling out, saying, give me a new name? I, I, I declined the assignment. One of the joys of being a writer <laughs> is that our, we're okay. not legislators, <laughs> and that feels too propositional, saying like this should be that, rather than here's what happens when you don't call this, you know, that in a sense, it, and I love manifestos and I use them as when I teach and stuff, but, but I don't really want to go kind of phrase by phrase, you know, and it also feels both dictatorial and janitorial. Well. Um, Nothing against janitors. No, 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 no. I, 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 I feel like I nearly should <laughs> say I stand corrected, but no. Um, <laughs> you sit corrected, um, um, to be exact. <laughs> all right, but um, I knew there would be at least one moment like this, and there probably will be another three or four. I should, I should hope so. Um, why not? Um, so the, the terms, you know, that... Um. <laughs> I'm thinking of Shelley's poets are the true legislators of the world because we're just in the wonderful Shelley yeah. room here, but they don't legislate that, like that. Wasn't that something? That was. That, that was. Yeah, we. I got to see original manuscripts by Mary Shelley, Mary Wollstonecraft, and other people in that circle, uh, wonderfully select, selected by the curator. Li archivist, librarian, I'm not sure what her title is there. And it was really thrilling to have that see, you know, the paper on which Mary Wollstonecraft herself, the mother of Mary Shelley, wrote a letter to her friend, wrote a page of her Declaration of the Rights of Women. And, uh, but, yeah, poets, the true and direct legislators. But their terms, I mean, their terms, after all these years of, of being in this country, terms that remain just mysterious, um, like pro-life. Well, that's a euphemism that Isn't should it? be dispensed with. Okay, so we're, and, we're, we're uh, constituting the dictionary. Yeah, now. yeah. And it's interesting because once you get people to accept a term like collateral damage or pro-life, you've, re you've really let them win in the same way that when you let someone else frame the terms of an argument, that's most of the work of having an argument and they've won. And, um, or, yeah. Or, or um, voter suppression. 
Well, voter fraud, is that what you're yeah. thinking of? Which is vote a, to a fraud, vote, vote to yeah. suppression. Well, voter suppression is a huge problem, which according to what I could put together after the election may have prevented as many as 20 million people from voting. It's the subject of one of the essays in here. And 20 million people means not that Hillary Clinton would have won. It would have, if those 20 million people were fully enfranchised and had as easy a time voting as I do, it would mean the Republican Party would have died as a national party a long time ago, and the Democratic Party would be accountable to poor people, young people, and people of color in so compelling a way. It would be a completely different party, and we would be living in a completely different country. And one thing that really connects the work I've done around race, around people like Jarvis Masters, speaking of the false, false accusations, an innocent man on death row, and a really good writer, and, um, you know, is this sense of the the do, what we what we called in postmodernism and sort of multiculturalism the dominant narrative is made by silencing other people. And Mary Beard addresses the silencing of women. You withdraw all these voices from the chorus, and you get you know the Kavanaugh is you know is sort of like you hear from people like Kavanaugh. You don't hear from their victims. You don't hear from the and. Voting is a form of speech. We've silenced 20 million people who would have spoken about their desire for a very different country. I think this country's built, you you know, founded on who couldn't speak. On women didn't get the vote till 1920. Black men did in the 1870s, but were then prevented from voting in all sorts of ways by Jim Crow and stuff in the South. Although, who was that? My friend was it? My friend Lauer was telling me about Weeksville here in Brooklyn, which was a consolidation of black population to give them some political clout as a voting bloc. So that did exist, but overall Native American people weren't recognized as citizens until somewhere in the 20th century, and so their voices were extracted from the story of who we are. And actually one of the things that made me hopeful, and that's been one of the most amazing things I've witnessed, is the Native and sort of ally activism around the quincentennial of Columbus's arrival in this hemisphere that restated the terms of that confrontation, asserted that Native Americans were still here, was part of an environmental revolution that recognized that virgin nature is a weirdly gendered misnomer because nature is not virginal, it's busy. And, um, you know, and Native people were all over everywhere except some very remote uh, places all over, you know, this planet and stuff. And to see that revolution of ideas take place made me hopeful in a new way, partly about the power of, stor of people on the fringes and margins to change the story. And a um, wonderful chapter about fringe yeah. and margins. Yeah, and you know, and Hope in the Dark is partly about how, s how most new things generate most I uh, on what's con sort of the shadows, the fringes, the margins, and eventually come to, well, center stage. And, um, and often, and it's funny because there is this thing when you're on stage for Zoe, you've spent time there, the lights are so blind you can't see the shadows and the margins. You know, it's, a, it's kind of but a one-way system. you feel the presence. Well, if you feel, if feel, you I should, mean, if you're, you know, in a position of power, but they often don't. And, and but, I, uh, but I, I do feel. Uh, and um, I do here, and it's nice because it's not that dark. It's not that dark. I've often uh, wanted to wear a hat so that, yeah. you know, I'm not being blinded. I can now see you all. Just no, but but I, I feel like one of the things I'm I'm happy about here yeah. is just um, having creating a space for attention. Yeah, well, I think, but I think libraries celebrate, writing comes in some sense, you go to a marginal space, you go to a quiet room alone to write, and I think that there is more sympathy in places like this, but I'm talking about stage in the sense of no, being, I'm you know, Mitch McConnell or something like that, and there's some really interesting work being done by um, contemporary psychologists about how power erodes your capacity for empathy and even awareness of other people. And it's one of the profound senses in which power corrupts. And uh, you, you have a um, perfect segue in some way. You have these uh, essays about corporations in 
and I'll mention one in particular. In 2010, you wrote an essay called Invasion of the Democracy Crushers, in which you quoted a terse comment by John Le Carré, where he says, the things that ha are gone in the name of the shareholder are, to me, as terrifying as the things that are done, dare I say it, in the name of God. That is truer than ever, it would seem. Oh, there's so much that could be said about that, about the way that capitalism measures d certain forms of direct consequences, namely profit to the shareholders, and ignores all kinds of you know, true cost accounting, uh, long-term stuff, and it's interesting because corporations did seem to be more interested in long-term stuff that this, you know, I don't know if it's sort of the rise of the MBA industry or something, but now there's the sort of quarterly returns or even the sort of lifespan, you know, the sort of longevity of the corporation's profitability. And actually there is a kind of patriarchal antics in Wall Street with its belief in its own rationality as you see panic sell-offs and, um, er irrational exuberances and things like that. But there is a way, and capitalism is a way to allow some people to benefit who haven't labored and many who labored to not benefit and many who will be harmed to be ignored, whether you're looking at the slave industry, the sugar industry, the fossil fuel industry, the sweatshops that make a lot of the clothes we're wearing you know, and things like that. And it's interesting because it feels sometimes like the Industrial Revolution is almost about the expansion of the world beyond our capacity to perceive it. And the work often of activists is to make the sweatshop workers on the other side of the globe visible, to make things visible, to make what DDT does to songbirds visible if you're Rachel Carson. I wrote a piece once with um, called The Silence of the Lambs Wool Cardigans. Yeah, yeah, about yeah. the fact we, that yeah. that you know 200 years ago it, your sweater was might have been made by yourself or your granny from sheep that were actually on the hillside you knew and now your sweaters are made in China and you'll never see the people who made them and you may not even understand all the processes by which they come to your department store or or your Amazon mail delivery or something. And there is this kind of deep alienation in global capitalism of not knowing, you know, how many of you have ever seen an oil well? You're not Californians, are you? It, uh, you know, like we've all driven in cars and most of us haven't seen oil wells or oil platforms in the Gulf or, you know, how many of you have seen an oil refinery? Okay, I live in the Bay Area where Chevron and other places have this giant toxic complex that gives lots of little kids asthma and things so it's, like that. It's, it's so, the... a, so it's like, how do you make that visible again? And that's also, you know, the... photojournalists and other people do it too. It's also a storytelling it's art. It's a role of, of... And are stories enough to substitute for seeing the sheep on the hillside and, and, where your and wool this, came from? And it's part of what we should do. I mean, I... Uh, I want to talk to you in a moment about monuments and uh, one person who was on, on this stage not that long ago with Sister Helen Prejean was Brian Stevenson. Yeah. And one of the things Brian Stevenson talks about is trying to make things proxemic, making them close again so that you actually hmm. see, you see things and when you see them perhaps you understand them in a new way. Um, euphemism in some way is keeping, I mean, I think that's what's so... Well, it's sort of a buffer zone. Yeah. You know, a kind of DMZ between the, the fact, what? fact, the, the what demilitarized the? zone, DMZ, oh. you know, that, that kind of dead zone between North and South Korea is what I'm thinking of, between sort of fact and consciousness, or actuality and consciousness, it keeps, it buffers uh, the knowledge, but shall we talk about monuments? Because that is, I, that, that's I, actually I, such I, a so relevant to this, whose story is this, this question of let, let, other let, voices. You know what, let's talk about monuments. Okay. Let's talk about monuments, and why don't we actually, um, 
look at monuments. Oh, uh, while okay. we talk, do you like that idea? Yes, I do. Okay. So oh, is that? Oh, you, you've you, got my you, San yeah, yeah, Francisco I'm, I'm, monument. Yeah, How exciting! Yeah, but I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce <laughs> it by like saying. I feel like I've looked I'm, at I'm the exam answers. I'm going to introduce it by saying what you say about monuments. Something that I adore. You say a city is a book we read by wandering its streets. A text that favors one version of history and suppresses another, mm. enlarges your identity or reduces it, makes you feel important or disposable, depending on who you are and what you are, who is remembered and how, who decides. These are political questions. Now, let's look at image number one. Should I read what is written there? I can or you can. You do. United States troops took over the state government and reinstated the usurpers, but the national election, November 1876, recognized white supremacy in the South and gave us our state. This is the only monument to killing police in the United States, and it was recently taken down um, by uh, the mayor of New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans had a t bunch of Confederate monuments four major ones came down, which was really pretty stunning. And I'd gotten to know New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And it was really kind of shocking to see the black uh, carnival parades march past the statue of Robert E. Lee on like this 100 foot high pillar in Lee's circle, which is now an empty pillar. I, would, I never really expected to see those things come down. And there were death threats as, a, and it's interesting, you can now connect women who report rapes and people who criticize Confederate statues because there were death threats against the contractor who was going to take them down and his Maserati was torched. And, um, you know, but they did, they took them down sort of early one morning, I think, without it being announced. They took down General Beauregard, etc. But this was about a kind of riot against the Reconstruction government that was recognizing the rights of black people, et cetera, you know, and the return to the kind of Jim Crow, death of reconstruction regime, uh, that's the recognized white supremacy. And it was up until last year in an Ameri on public land in an American city, David Duke had defended it. Mm -hmm. And there'd been some fuss about it before. And, um, and it came down partly because black people spoke up. And there's this interesting process where through various complex processes, black voices become more audible. The unbearability of Confederate monuments becomes more perceptible to those of us who aren't black. The illegitimacy of public space being occupied by such monuments happens. And it's interesting how it changes. And, um, you know, and it applies in other ways, that we have a lot of statues of racists and et cetera. I know New, York, New York Central Park did took down the statue of the gynecologist who performed brutal experiments on enslaved w uh, black women. And, um, but New York City, at the time of the New York Atlas, I did a map called City of Women, which changes all your subway stops to the names of great, or at least consequential New York women, because New York named almost nothing after women. And it was a real shock to me. I've been talking to my friends on this trip about a category of things that are so invisible, they're invisible to your, um, you, don't, you don't know they're absent. It's a bit like Rom, um, Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns. But it was really not until I did that map that I realized I'd spent my whole life in places named after men. I live in a city named after St. Francis. I do live in a state named after Califia, the queen of a Spanish romance. And uh, you know, that's kind of a play on the, Muslim idea of the caliph, and I live in a caliphate. And, um, but mostly, you know, like they named all these streets after black men in Harlem, but there aren't any, there's a Harriet Tubman street, but nobody knows the name, uses the name, it uses its old name, and Google doesn't know there's a Harriet Tubman Boulevard. There is a long boulevard named after um, Anne Hutchison in the Bronx. But you will have literally have five statues of historic female figures, three of them relatively recent in New York. It's Joan of Arc, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, Gertrude Stein, um, a nice Israeli lady, 
and I forget who the fifth one is, five statues, and like there's hundreds of statues of men. What does that do to expand little boys' sense of themselves and their possibilities and wither away girls? And what happens? And part of why Mayor Landrieu took down the statues in New Orleans was that um, Wynton Marsalis talked to him about what is it like being black and seeing these people who denied your humanity and wanted you to be a person without rights, to be property, you know, kind of as the icon, the chief icons of the city. It was interesting that that photo was taken by Dorothea Lang. At uh, yeah. which photo? The, the one we saw, the, yeah. the monument. Let's look at image number two. Yeah, this is, there's a pioneer monument erected by one of the, got erected by a city father in the 19th century, and it's kind of like some California history the way they thought of it then. And this is a padre and a vaquero uh, when we were Mexico or Spain before we were part of the US, when y'all Yankees came and stole Mexico's northern half in 1848, 1846-1848. And it's a really weird thing. It really looks like a BDSM thing. The, the, pa the vaquero, which is Spanish, it's where we get Bacaru from, which is a kind of cowboy, was holding a whip that's been removed and they both have these hands raised as though to rain down blows. And the Indian who looks like the last of the Mohicans, he does not look much in his dress or his physiognomy like a native Californian, seems to be kind of cringing and taking instruction and subjugated. And there's been protests for a while against it. There was a whole round in uh, 1996 for which there was ultimate risk. And it was funny because there was a debate. The Archbishop of San Francisco got involved because he didn't want the um, Junipero Serra and the Padres being trashed. And actually, most of the genocide against Native Californians wasn't by the Spanish who wanted to integrate them into their society at the very bottom, but still integrate them and exploit them as as sort of serfs and slaves, whereas the whites who came during the gold rush, the Yankees wanted to exterminate them and did a very, uh, did kill about 90% of native Californians in a very, uh, who remained after s European diseases and stuff. So the plaque, so a, like there was a lot of debate and then a plaque went up, but that wasn't good enough. So they took this down in the last month or so. Let's and look, it's really kind of amazing, it's been up Let's look at image number three, if we could. Yeah, it's been up for, and the statue's been, was re-erected when the new public library was opened on the site of the Sandlot riots, where the anti-Chinese anti riots of 1877. You know, it's funny, you, 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 you paused on the word erected. It just sounded rather, not euphemistic, but uh, elusive. But you yeah. know, you know um, it brought back an, a really, really old memory. Uh, Flaubert wrote a book, a dictionary called Le Dictionnaire des Idées Reçues, The Dictionary yeah. of Received Ideas. Yeah. And he has an entry which is erected. And there's a definition. And the definition that Flaubert gives, if memory serves, is erected, colon, only say it about monuments. <laughs> Lucy Lepard, who was a New York Manhattan resident for many years, did a wonderful project talking about holes and erections, how cities are built up out of things dug out of the country, so that when you see, you know, the marble in this building, mar it was chiseled out of a quarry somewhere, all the cement and concrete and stone and steel and et cetera that's made, you know, Manhattan go up dozens of stories all over, is you know, left holes in, a, in the countryside and where she now lives and, uh, you know, but so we now have an empty plinth. And it's interesting because this removal of these really problematic monuments is coupled with new things like new civil rights monuments in the South and I'd really like, like the, to the, like see... Like Brian Stevenson. Yeah, oh that's who that yeah, is. Yeah, I didn't is, remember the name. Yeah. Um, but uh, museum, f it isn't takes soil from different, uh, what is it called? Lynching I'm forgetting sites. Now. Yeah, I'm forgetting Lynching sites and fills yeah. those columns with them. And yeah. Um, let's look at, quickly, let's look at images four, five, six. 
and seven if we could. Oh, yes, uh, Juan de Oñate's foot. Shall I tell the story? Yeah, do. So New Mexico is a really interesting place. It's a white minority state, and I think it, I don't know if it always has been, I think maybe it is. It has a very strong Hispano, which is what the kind of conquistador and after Spanish, rather than Mexican or Latin American identified migrants call themselves, including some of my relatives. It also has a huge native population, much of which still lives where it did before the various invasions. And there's a very funny thing that happens where the Hispanos often complain about us gringos invading them and then a native person mentions, we remember when you came and there's like a slight rearrangement of um, things. But uh, for the 400th anniversary of Wanda and Yate, one of the conquistadors, they erected a statue of him in, um, what's the town just north of Santa Fe? Somebody here knows. No, that's way north. Española. Somebody here knows. And um, so they erected, I think it was around Española, they erected a statue of Añate, who, there was a Pueblo revolt, which is one of the great Indian revolts, along with the slave result, revolts that should be part of every kid's history. And the reconquest involved a massive brutality, and Añate had them cut off the foot of every man and adolescent boy in the Pueblos to prevent them from being able-bodied and able to rise again. So when the statue was erected, its foot was cut off and sent to one of the museums as a sort of relic and trophy of war. And I think that they may have been replaced and removed repeatedly. There's also a statue to Kit Carson in the plaza in Santa Fe um, praising Kit Carson, who did horrible things to Native people, as well as marrying one Native person. And it's what, like, praised him for conquering savage whatevers, and somebody, some m men, probably Native, in sort of worker jumpsuits came in in the 1970s with um, equipment and chiseled the word savage off, so there's that little thing. But we're in this interesting process and yeah. of re thinking our public stuff, London and Paris, or thinking about adding a lot of women's names. I think New York is going through a process like that to addressing the, the gender balance, which since it doesn't have to be white women's names can redress some of the racial stuff. Uh, a lot of new uh, monuments are coming, or some new monuments are going up. I think we could use a lot more. Some are coming then, down. Like, and then image number six and seven. I, I found yeah. this so interesting. Yeah, is this, this is one of the, oh, these are the... They call them the Stolperzein. Yeah, which is like stumble stones. There's an artist all over, who all over Germany is inserting these tiles where you can trip over them, which are where Jews were, the places Jews lived when they were sent off to the camps to be exterminated. And there's been a number of interesting projects. There's also somebody who projected images from historic photos, putting the Jews back in Berlin, um, Shimona. So here, here you have to. Yeah. It actually would yeah. make you. It could make you trip and stumble. They stick out. Yeah, and but there's been a lot of interesting kind of counter history happening, and I think it's really quite exciting. And I also think we're only at the beginning of it. I think of like when my my nephews are old men, my great nieces are old women. May they live in a completely different set of memories about who matters, who we celebrate, who we want to emulate, who our museums and boulevards and bridges should be named after. So in, in a sense here, um, Rebecca, as we, as we wind down, um, you, speaking about your nephew um, and nieces, the, the sentence of Virginia Woolf resonates in new... The future is yeah. dark, which is the best thing it can be, I yeah, think. Yeah, I think. Is, is that, that is very hopeful. And, and this is where yeah. you speak about hope as something that is complex and open. And it made me think of a line I, I adore of Adorno and Horkheimer, where they say, I do believe, I do believe that things will not turn out well, but the idea that they might mm. 
is of decisive importance. Yeah, and I feel like uncertainty, which is kind of a guiding principle for, for both the field guide to getting lost and hope in the dark, as I was saying, that we're in a state of kind of intensified uncertainty. I did not expect this resurgence of, a, of macho authoritarianism around the world that we're seeing in the Philippines and parts of Latin America, maybe in Brazil, um, parts of Eastern Europe, and um, you know Russia with Putin and things like that. But we also have this broadening, deepening, strengthening, inclusive sense of human rights, equality, etc. that's really been a long revolution beginning in many places. You could sort of begin it with the civil rights movement in the Black South, except that that derives from Gandhi, who draws influence, as I track in one of the essays in Hope in the Dark, from the suffragist movement in England to do his own work in South Africa. And, um, but there is, there is this, I think in this country in particular, something incredibly hopeful. In 2045, we become a white minority country, at which point the Republican Party has either become a kind of apartheid era, Afrikaner style government, you know, of a minority population, or it's died a hideous and well earned death, <laughs> or become something completely unrecognizable, and the Democratic Party is accountable to, you know, um, a non white majority. So, but, the, but it's not just the dem, and the demographics are hopeful, but also a lot of young people's understanding of gender and race and, and do you know rights and compassion and so you are anti-capitalism so you and stuff? Are. So there's, th I, th yeah. I think, well, hope doesn't mean that everything's going to be fine. No. And I feel like we're in this kind of epic struggle. It's like one of those, and this is a word you can pronounce because you speak German, Gotterdämmerung. Gotterdämmerung. There. I, yeah. And it's, um, it's, oh, I was close, amazingly enough. So many words I know only from I reading. But I wasn't very close to Koya, as you yeah, will remember. Well, was thought perhaps we're preaching wait, wait, to the a kind of sisal mat, but I digress. But um, I was going to say, it does feel like we're in this epic struggle where, and a lot of people, it's not my idea, feel that maybe it's because kind of white supremacist patriarchy is in its death throes that it's thrashing about so violently. And there is a way when you're not fighting to control something, you can appear to be very gentlemanly as white supremacist patriarchy mostly has, you know, when you don't have to keep women out and people and push people of color out and stuff, you can look very calm and composed. And when now, you, when you mention uh, yeah. hope and optimism and pessimism, I think that Havel caught that so beautifully when yeah. he said, "Hope is not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well." but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. And and, yeah, and you have to do things knowing that you don't know if it will work. You have to push for good people to be elected even though you don't know if they'll win the elections. You have to, you know, when you look at the really visionary people, the abolitionists, for example, to think you could abolish slavery in the United States in 1845 was probably seemed you know, it was small groups of people without very much power. And it seemed like, you know, a long shot would be a really polite term for it. It seemed foolish, on, like so many things, same-sex marriage at a certain point in time, women's votes, you know. It seemed extremely unlikely. And then it, and then, then it and then became it something that was so important. A war was fought over it. And then, you and know, you and then slavery was abolished. And you talk about it and in that, that way. If those, if those people had said, we, 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 we won't do anything to abolish slavery because it seems really unlikely we'll win, nothing would have been done. So I also believe in... In what might you happen. Know, in what something better than pragmatism, the kind of idealism or aspiration that's not practical. Or that we, we will never see the Practical results Practical strategies, of. yeah, yeah. You know, well, there's other things. Most of the women who started the women's suffrage movement in the 19th century, I don't know if any of them s lived to see women get the vote in 1920. Adam Hochschild wrote that wonderful book, Bury the Chains, about 
12 Quakers who decided to abolish slavery in the British Empire. It took 50 years and only one of them was alive when it happened. And it's interesting because I think actually on climate change, we have seen a lot of dramatic and really revolutionary things happen in consciousness, in an energy revolution. We did not actually have the solar and wind to leave fossil fuels behind. They were expensive, awkward, kind of infant technologies. They are now so cheap and effective that we really could leave fossil fuels behind. But the problems now are political and imaginative. Political in that you know, politicians tend to cleave to the status quo and imaginative in that a lot of people don't understand that we must do it, we can do it, and that actually it isn't a great renunciation that actually everything would be so much better if kids weren't inhaling those. I mean, like everything about fossil fuels is so toxic, including what it does to global politics. And uh, Rebecca, what a, what a journey it has been. I, I started by saying that in, in some way, thinking about your work made me think about some of the comments that Foucault uh, made quite a long time ago, that it seemed that in some way you, you embodied them. And there's one line you quote in the new book of Foucault that seems to me a good place where we can end, where you say, people know what they do. Frequently they know why they do what they do. But what they don't know is what what they do does. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.